Oh boy. Oh boy. Uh, yesterday was pretty cool. Um, and we've got um, a really fun um, uh, 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 a, a party here for you. Um, let's start just by um, everybody uh, in the chat, um, please share um, where you uh, were on the solstice. Um, and uh, so not necessarily like I was at grandma's house, that's cool, but we're interested more where you are geographically on the globe. Oh, um, Amelia, would you please bring me my globe? I don't know if you can hear that. <clears throat> um, where you were on the globe. And the, um, then what we're going to do is to, um, so we're going to have some people in the northern hemisphere, some people from the southern hemisphere, people will be checking in. Um, and we also have today our a, a special guest. Um, we have Ann Chadwick uh, from Point Blue Conservation Science, who's going to be talking to us um, about a little bit about some of the research that Point Blue is doing on Antarctica um, with penguins. And then we're also going to check in with her brother, John Chadwick, who is an Antarctic researcher who has been there on a solstice and he's going to describe for us the experience of had you been on the um so he was uh, standing on a river of ice on the solstice um and uh, not this solstice the previous one um and he will describe for us um what it's like there also a little bit about the research that was uh, uh being done there really really interesting story we're going to get to hear in from all over the globe from uh, from people in our community here about where you were and, um, and, and how you observed the solstice. And we're gonna take a look at the journal pages from a bunch of different journalers and get ideas of ways of kind of framing, exploring and celebrating this event on your pages. Um, and that will be a lot of fun. So we're really into some, for some cool stuff today. Um, again, we have, uh, we hope that we're covering uh, as much of this planet as we can. And uh, to get us started, I'm going to spotlight um, Ann Chadwick. Um, so again, she is um, part of the team at Point Blue Conservation Science, which is a wonderful organization that does, um, does, does research on bird populations worldwide. And she's uh, and is involved in part of the um, Antarctic research. So Anne, thank you so much for being with us. You're a regular participant in these and now we're really happy to have you present. Welcome. Thank you so much, Jack. And hi, everybody. It's so great to see all of you. And uh, today I want to share something, but guess what? It's not my nature journal. It's my big brother. Yeah, my brother John Chadwick is joining us from Southern California because he has experienced the solstice twice on the ice in Antarctica. And John, I think it was in 1989 and 90, or 90 and 91, um, but a long time ago, let's just say. And um, so looking forward to hearing from him and sharing some slides. But before that, Jack asked me to talk a little bit about Point Blue. Uh, because we had hoped to do maybe a live feed from the Antarctic uh, field station that we have and talk about the solstice, but we just don't have the bandwidth. In fact, we can barely get um, email there. So uh, short of that, let me just, I'm going to share a couple of slides as well and talk about Point Blue Conservation Science. So let's see, I'll put up the slides because you know, they're better than my face. There, isn't that cuter? Um, <laughs> can you see my screen all right? We, we, we see it really well and okay. uh, mighty cute. So at this point, I am sketching my first penguin uh, while Anne is talking. <laughs> there will be some, so, uh, and I'll try not to go too fast, but I don't want to take up too much time either. But um, I am vice chair of the board of Point Blue Conservation Science, which is a nonprofit organization doing climate smart research and conservation around the world. We have 160 scientists on staff 
and we collaborate with or organizations all over the place. And one of the projects that we've been doing for 25 years running now is uh, researching Adelie penguins in Antarctica. And one of the things that we've done just for the last two years that's pretty exciting is we have three drones that we can send up overhead to look at, uh, to get aerial views of these penguins. And we're working with Stanford to develop um, artificial intelligence capabilities to send out the drones most efficiently, but also count the penguins and see what's going on with the colony. And I'm sharing this slide because um, this was one of our interns last season, um, mm -hmm. Parker, Parker Levinson. And um, she talked about why she did this project with us and why Point Blue. And I just loved that her number one was curiosity. And so uh, we know that curiosity is important for great science and for great nature journaling as well. She also wanted to stretch herself and I figured, well, you know, I guess if you want to get outside your comfort zone, maybe you can go to Antel. <laughs> um, so uh, our chief science officer, Grant Ballard, is um, he is in, an Art in Antarctica right now and he basically has a PhD in penguins, so that's his happy place. And um, our intern, Parker, last season did this uh, survey on productivity by subcolony. And so this is, uh, the picture here is typical Adelie penguins with their chicks. So they're, they're usually black and white as adults and big gray fat fluff balls as chicks. But some of them stay, they keep a gray color or even a brown and white marking. So what Parker did was study the breeding success of the kind of minority group, the oddly colored adult penguins. Um, so I am going to put into the chat after we're done uh, a link to this quarterly, which uh, we devoted entirely to our work in Antarctica. So it has some great articles and pretty pictures. Um, and I will also put up a link to our um, some drone footage that's really fun of what we're doing in Antarctica. If you would, um, Anne, put up that, uh, the link to that video sort of talking also about how they're kind of coming up with this new AI to have those, that, that, that is absolutely fascinating stuff. I think there's, there's a lot of curious people who'd be really kind of into it, how AI is now driving the drones. Absolutely. That'd yeah. be really cool. And that's a really great project with Stanford. So um, I will put up that link as well. Um, and so here's Grant Ballard, our chief science officer with, I don't know, how many do you think? We'll do a little counting, counting project here. How many of his little friends do you see there? <laughs> and spoiler alert, I didn't count them individually. So Jack's guessing, I can see. I was thinking a couple hundred. What do you think, Jack? Um, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm thinking, um, so what, what I'm doing is I'm going, I went one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and sort of put my finger around 10, and then kind of went further back in space and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. What ten is in the back? So then I kind of got what a what a sort of how wide I think a strip is, kind of going down that would have about thirty in it. And then I'm counting by thirty, so I'm going three. So I'm going to guess. Uh, we'll count it later. Everybody, make your own guess of how many penguins. And I'll tell you what my number is. If I tell you my number first, then we're all going to anchor the, on that. <laughs> um, and, um, but so come up with your, um, um, your, your guess and without looking at anybody else's, um, uh, you, we can all drop them into the chat. Um, I'll put mine in, but don't look at others, um, before, and then some brave person is actually going to count them all. Yeah, no cheating. Okay. So, um, and here's one of our interns with a little fluff ball that she's going to measure and um, band so that we can watch it through its life cycle. And one of the things that we're most proud of is, um, <laughs> Jack, you need to draw those, not just- Oh, 
<laughs> I've got my, I've got uh, two sketches going, so I'm going to get a third on right. Okay, now. good. Um, one of the things we're really proud of, and this is what Grant Ballard did, was um, an international effort that took many years and was very arduous, but we were successful in establishing an international marine protected area for the entire Ross Sea. So that means that it won't be overfished. It won't be, you know, the resources won't be um, over extracted from there. And a couple of facts and figures, because we know we like those too. The, the new protected area of the Ross Sea is twice the size of Texas. And the um, emissions that are sequestered or the, the carbon sequestered is equivalent to taking 10 million cars off the road. So we're really pleased about that. Um, you can also see that those little Adelie penguins get around almost 8,000 miles of migration in a year. Mm. So with that, I invite you to uh, come and see us at Point Blue Conservation Science. I wish we could do it in person, but short of that, um, you can go to pointblue.org and see about our other programs. We do lots of education, uh, outdoor restoration work with kids, uh, working landscapes with agriculture and carbon sequestration, ocean research, uh, protecting our shorelines using nature-based solutions to deal with um, sea level rise, and lots, lots more. So with that, I will stop my screen share and turn it back over to Jack and welcome my big brother, John. All right. Hey, uh, Anne, thank you so much. Uh, we are, are, are very, um, and we're going to be actually be doing some uh, going into the future uh, Point Blue and uh, Nature Journal workshops. We're going to be doing a few other things. We're going to be meeting with some of their researchers and then doing some journaling around things that their researchers are researching and connecting science, data, evidence, and Nature Journal observation. It's going to be very cool. So looking forward to that with you, Anne. Um, now we're going to jump out onto the ice of Antarctica with somebody who has been boots on the ground there. Um, some and uh, so what I'd like to do is just sort of invite you to kind of um, imagine yourself um, immersed in this totally crazy different world. And we're going to hear from, so John is a very curious person, right? Um, and like many of us in this community, likes to kind of geek out on things and think stuff is cool because stuff is. And uh, so um, we're going to hear from John. Um, then what we're going to do is we'll have uh, time for, um, I'm, I'm going to ask people to, as uh, he's presenting, we're going to um, write some questions to John into our chat, and we'll collect a few of those. Um, while those are accumulating, we're going to go around different places in the world, northern and southern hemisphere, find out from people at different latitudes what you saw yesterday, how your journal looks. We'll do some journal sharing. Then we'll give John an opportunity to answer some of those questions. Also, if anybody has questions for Anne, you can ask those as well. Um, John Chadwick, it is a pleasure to have you with us um, on my screen. You're over there. So, um, John, it's really good to have you with us. Um, and uh, I, let's, um, I have never been to Antarctica and would love to hear um, a little bit about your experience of, of being out there on the ice in the solstice. So same planet totally crazy different place. Everybody check out what it's like to be in Antarctica on the solstice. Thank you, Jack. Thank you very much. And my uh, welcome everybody. And thank you for being here. Uh, and thank you to my sister and to Jack for putting me up to this nonsense. <laughs> um, this was a great time of our life. Uh, my sister and I were very lucky to grow up outdoors and we camped at age nine and 10 without any adults. We came back the next day from our home and so Antarctica was a continuation of that, plus my affinity for fixing and building anything that broke. So I was really more of an engineer than a scientist, but I enjoyed my time in Antarctica so much because it welded these two skills together of being outdoors all the time and enjoying uh, mechanical things, making things fix and work and run well and work properly so that the scientists could get their numbers. So, um, and if we could pull up the screen that shows kind of the what we're going to talk about, the, the, the um, <clears throat> kind of word document. Um, there's, um, so first I'll talk about Antarctica. 
And then I have some solstice fun facts to share. So what you're looking at here is a picture of Mount Erebus. And it's the only active volcano. It's about, I forget, 12 or 13,000 feet high. And it's in the uh, McMurdo Sound and near the Ross Ice Shelf. And McMurdo is a beautiful, beautiful place. And it's a very historic place. Today, it has, it's the US and New Zealand both have their main bases there in McMurdo. But more importantly, it's the historic launching point for all of the uh, famous uh, expeditions to the South Pole in the early 1900s for Scott and Shackleton and Amundsen. Amundsen just beat Scott. And of course, Scott died on the way back to his base camp at the uh, at McMurdo. Um, so it's a very historic place and there's still a lot of historical evidence that I got to see there. So we spent a lot of time at McMurdo and then we flew a thousand miles inland to our base near the South Pole. And in McMurdo also, there's a, there's a seasonal, um, uh, the sound, much of the ice blows out to sea every year, but near that there's a permanent ice shelf. So you have temporary ice and permanent ice. And uh, it's very interesting getting to and from on these big airplanes and stuff. So anyway, our project at Upstream Bravo, about again, 200 miles from the South Pole, was to determine the flow mechanism of a giant glacier uh, so giant, in fact, that it was 20 miles wide, a mile thick, and hundreds of miles long. Uh, this is known as rapid surge because this whole thing was moving 10 feet a day. Some glaciers only move that far in a year, and this thing was moving 10 feet every day, which was rapid surge. And it has since slowed down, and there's another ice stream nearby called Ice Stream C, and that one has stopped flowing a, few hundred, a couple hundred years ago for some reason. But it used to flow just like this. And this is on totally flat land. Uh, it's fed by distant mountains that are hundreds of miles away, so far away we couldn't even see them. And these are the ski equipped uh, C-130 airplanes that brought us to and from Antarctica and they brought us supplies and they brought our, our 10 tons of equipment to drill holes in the ice. So um, we used hot water to drill holes in the ice a mile deep. And it took about 24 hours to drill a hole a mile deep. And the reason again was to determine the flow mechanism, like what's greasing the skids down there. Glaciers have four or five different standard flow mechanisms. Sometimes they're, they're solid ice and they break and they just slide like a dry shearing motion. And sometimes there's a wet bunch of mud down below and the mud, so that means it's at melting point. There's water at the bottom, even though the glacier might be 26 degrees below zero centigrade. The bottom of it is, in our case, happened to be liquid water. And that water, as the pressure of that water builds up, it kind of floats the glacier on its bed and lets the glacier slide along. And that turned out to be our flow mechanism. And so now, um, <clears throat> that's kind of what we were doing there. It was a lot of fun and a lot of things went wrong that I got to fix. So um, I was very pleased with that. I was able to fix every one of them. And uh, so now we'll turn to, uh, since we're talking about solstice and celebrating all that, um, <laughs> here we were in Antarctica where the sun stayed up all day and just went round and round in circles about 20 degrees off the horizon. And because we were a couple hundred miles from the South Pole, the sun did move up and down very slightly as it went around. So we had a tool with us just for fun really uh, called a theodolite, which is a fancy surveying instrument so the theodolite is mounted on a tripod and we could take sun sightings with the theodolite and measure its angle to the horizon. And uh, when the sun reached its highest point, we knew that that was the time of local noon at our location. So we were able to determine this quite easily because it was clear most of the time, clear weather most of the time. So we could always take these sun sightings and my sister has just put up a slide showing what's called an analemma, and I'll get to that in the next section, but this shows what the sun does throughout the year. Um, if the earth didn't, I'll, I'll get to that in the next, in the solstice fun facts, tonight, but I'll finish up on the theodolite. So we use the theodolite to determine local noon. So since we were there from um, November through uh, early, late February, early March, um, we were able to uh, 
we were there during the uh, on December 22nd or 21st, we were there during the summer solstice for the Southern Hemisphere. So the, obviously our highest sighting, our highest angle of a local noon sun sighting was the solstice. And thinking back, I'm not sure, but it seems to me that we might have had to wait a day to, to make sure that December 21st really was the solstice because if it was higher on the 22nd, that would make the 22nd the solstice. So anyhow, um, we were able to measure that with our theodolite in Antarctica. So uh, that, that will conclude for right now the uh, Antarctica part. And now I'll talk just briefly about my solstice fun facts because I love this stuff. So the analemma is what the figure eight that my sister showed, that's called an analemma. It's kind of, it's shown on a lot of globes and maps. And the fact is that our orbit around the sun is nowhere near perfect. It's rather elliptical and it's off center. So in our winter time in the Northern hemisphere, we happen to be closer to the sun and farther away during the summer. So um, the earth speeds up and slows down and it gets, um, so that's why if, if it was a perfect round orbit and everything was just right, this wouldn't be a figure eight. This would just be a straight line at that same angle and halfway in between, not where the two lines cross at the eight, but halfway between the apex and the, the well, the perihelion, the aphelion, uh, halfway between would be the uh, equinox, uh, not the equinox, the, yeah, the equinoxes would be right in between. So, so anyhow, it's a very interesting figure and there's a lot of ways to record that. So, um, the, uh, by the way, uh, the figure eight, uh, June is at the top in the Northern hemisphere, June's at the top of that figure eight and December's at the bottom. So another point I like to make is that the solstice, even though the solstice uh, yesterday is the shortest day of the year, but with our imperfection, with our imperfect orbit, it doesn't have the latest sunrise or the earliest sunset. Those happen on different days. And the latest sunrise will occur on January 3rd. And the earliest sunset already occurred back on December 7th. So they're both staggered by about two weeks, which is really remarkable. Even though yesterday was the shortest day, they, because of this figure eight thing and this imperf imperfect uh, orbit and because of the equation of time, why uh, those dates are staggered by a couple of weeks. Uh, so say, say that again, um, the earliest sunset. Uh, yeah, earliest sunset is uh, December 7th. It already happened well before the solstice. Is December 7th. Yes. And the latest sunrise. Yeah, latest sunrise it won't be until this, uh, January 3rd. Oh, that's cool. That's, yeah, no, that's just, it just adds a whole level of weirdness that is yeah. just neat. Oh, it really is strange. Yeah, it's very strange. And, uh, and by the way, I didn't put it in my notes, but one thing I'd like to talk about too is, you know, our 24 hour days, when you think about it, since we're, since we're going around the sun, the earth has to turn around one time. But if the earth does a, a full rotation of 360 degrees, um, so, so let's, let me point it out this way. Like if I had a, not that we should look straight at the sun with our eye, that would hurt, but if we had <laughs> go pointing straight at the sun and we look through it one day and then wait for the earth to turn around 360 degrees, if we look through that telescope again, it's not going to be pointed at the sun because we have moved a little ways around the sun during those 24 hours. And the earth has to rotate a little bit more than 360 degrees to be for this telescope to be pointed right at the sun again. So we measure everything in solar time. And there's another kind of time called sidereal time, which simply means star time. So if you were looking from the distant stars or from way above the solar system down at the earth, and you were just watching the earth turn around 360 degrees, that's a sidereal day, is just when the, when the Earth turns 360 degrees. But it has to turn more than 360 degrees for a solar time day, which is what we measure. So that's an interesting little difference in the way to look at things. It's just a different perspective, like where are you looking at things from?
So that's another little twist. So, so is this solar uh, a solar day? Is that longer or shorter than a sidereal? Uh, the solar day is a little bit longer. I forget how long. I don't know if it's up to a minute or if it's just. I think it's a minute and a half or something, but it might be less than that. I should have looked that up. <laughs> that's easy to find. So that's kind of fun. Um, and okay. so that's the whole idea that time is more nuanced and yeah. interesting than you thought. Hey, um, John, a couple of yeah. things. Um, could you tell us, yesterday you told me a really funny story about what the person asked you when you got yeah. off the yeah, plane. Sure. The other sure. thing, I was wondering if I could get you to stand up, back up. Yeah, yeah I'll do that. And, and with your arm, point yeah, to what the sure. sun does. Okay, great. Yeah. So first of all, we're going to, uh, this is the sun, the path of the sun, like I said, it just went around in circles and went up and down only very slightly. It went up and down a lot more in McMurdo, but it still never set. It just went up and down and went around and around. So it looked like this, if I may take a second here. Uh, so if the sun was at this angle, it just went up a little, down a little, up a little, down like that. So you're, you're, so you're, you're, you, if you're standing in one place, you would watch your shadow getting longer and shorter and making a full circuit around you over the course of a day. Yes, that's right, yeah. Yeah, and the other funny thing that Jack was mentioning was that uh, when we first arrived at our camp in upstream Bravo near the South Pole, we, uh, about 10 of us showed up on a, on a C-130 airplane and we got on the plane and the camp manager, he simply said, welcome to upstream Bravo. What time do you want it to be? And I realized what a profound question and that I would never be asked that question for the rest of my life. What time do you want it to be? Because it was so arbitrary, it didn't make any difference. So I said something, you know, something smart ass like, well, I'm hungry, I want it to be dinner time. But uh, it turned out that we just stayed on McMurdo time so that our radio communications and everything would just flow more easily because uh, it really didn't make any difference to us uh, because the, there was no climatic change or change in light or atmosphere during the day because it just the sun just went around and around so that was a fascinating question that i i dearly love and <laughs> my life yeah and um i'd like to point out by the way i uh i saw my sister showed me some of your fantastic drawings i was so impressed with the drawings and the interpretations and the care that went into your uh, all of your work on the and, and and you know anticipation of the solstice and mapping the, the flight of the sun and everything. And I wanted you to, I wanted to point out that uh, I like to remind people that uh, at this time of year and at the June uh, uh, solstice, I mean, I'm sorry, the uh, equinox. Um, no, I guess, uh, yeah, summer and winter solstice, June uh, solstice. Um, the rate of change in the length of the day is very, very small. Like these days are, you don't notice it, the day's getting much, much shorter now. They're really short right now, but it's not changing really fast because the change in the length of a day is a maximum at the equinoxes in June. No, I'm sorry, at the equinoxes in March and September. Those, those times, the days are changing so fast, you walk in and go, my God, it's getting, it's staying light so much longer. And then in the fall, you say, gosh, it's getting dark so much earlier. And it's a very, very fast rate of change at the equinoxes. But at the solstices, it's very, very slow. It, and it comes to a stop, in fact, at the solstice itself. And another thing I'd like to point out is that our 23 and a half degrees of tilt of our axis makes absolutely no difference at the equinoxes, that is, in September and in March. But uh, because on those days, um, you could actually rotate the 23 degrees, could be 90 degrees, 100 degrees, 200 degrees, it doesn't matter. You could just spin the earth around and around on its axis and you would still get 12 hours of day and night everywhere on earth. So the 23 degrees is completely arbitrary on those two dates. But on the, uh, at, the, at the solstice, it makes the most difference because the tilt of the 23 and a half degrees is is what gives us our you know maximum angle on that on that solstice so and by the way i think at the south pole if i was standing actually at the south pole i think i would measure 23 and a half degrees 
to the angle of the highest sun at the solstice itself, at the moment of the solstice. So um, our, our tilt makes the most difference at solstice and the least difference at the equinox. So no, those, so, um, those no, are, so, something that's kind of fun is that we had a uh, solstice party like this on the summer solstice on the last equinox. And now here again, on our summer solstice party, we found exactly what you found, that everybody had these dramatic differences depending on where they were. And on the equinox, a party, it was not as dynamic and exciting, but we're in for a bunch of really different reports from people right now. Um, so that's, that's a fantastic segue. Oh, you're muted, John, you're muted. I hadn't thought of this before the presentation, but this was kind of interesting too. Um, my wife and I were cross country skiing in uh, northern parts of Sweden and Norway, and it would the sun would set at three o'clock, but we could still ski until about six o'clock because the uh, the angle of the sunset was like this. It was so diagonal, it was such a low angle that even three hours after sunset. Uh, it was still a little bit light outside. And then just the opposite happened when I was playing around with some friends in, in Costa Rica, you know, not that far from the equator. And we were playing an outdoor game of Frisbee or soccer or something. And my friend who lived there said, we better get everything prepared because, and I, as we said, why, what are you talking about? Well, because the sun's about to go down. And we're like, so what? Well, when the sun goes down at the equator, it gets dark almost instantly because the sun is going straight down. So there's a huge difference. As you get towards the northern and southern latitudes, the sun is coming in at a very, very shallow angle, setting at a very shallow angle. And then at the, at the equator, it's just going straight down and it gets dark right now. That's, a, that's another solstice fun fact. <laughs> yeah, that's right. There's a, 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 a a, a Kipling poem uh, called yeah. Mandalay, um, in which oh, he yeah. says, and the dawn comes up like thunder outer China across the bay. Um, yeah. So the uh, idea of the, the dawn coming up like thunder, this like, boom, it's dawn. Yeah. Well, yeah. you're going to get that uh, yeah. the closer you are to the equator. Yes. So yeah. thank you so much. Yeah. That is really yeah. cool. Enjoy. Um, uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to just start jumping around the world um, and uh, um, so we're going to start jumping around the world to, um, to, to hear reports and see journal pages from, from different people. Um, also, people will probably be sharing stuff that they did on the Great Conjunction. Um, and uh, that was, was also really fun. The, uh, the way that this is going to work um, is, is, oh, by the way, as, as people have more questions for John, please type those into the chat. Um, Brian, if you could monitor those and uh, towards the end, we're gonna see if we can uh, drop a few more questions on John or questions for, for, for other people, we can monitor that chat. I'm going to go over to the gallery view um, if uh, first, I wanted to hear if anybody is in the um, if you are at a a really high latitude or a low. Actually, let's start equatorial. Let's start equatorial um, for anybody who is close close to the equator on this call. What I want to invite you to do is to activate your screen and wave at us and. Um, I will jump over to you, or you can just uh, hold on. Let's uh, let's allow people to unmute themselves. Hold on a second here. Okay, I've just allowed you to unmute yourself. So if you don't feel comfortable um, sharing your screen, that is fine. Um, you can all you can you'll be able to talk to us and just say like, "Hey, I'm here," but you can't see me waving. So this is me talking, and that's cool. Um, but if you are, is there anybody on our call here who is uh, equatorial um, or fairly close to the equator? All right. 
So what we're going to do um, is I'm going to go, uh, we're going to uh, expand out um, to anybody living um, between uh, uh, the, let's see, uh, let's start kind of zooming out away from the, the, the equator. Um, is anybody, uh, so from sort of in the, sort of the, the, the sort of you, you're, you're occupying a place sort of towards the middle of our globe here. Um, if anybody's uh, reporting in from that area, we'd love to hear from folks. We're going to eventually crawl our way to north and we're going to crawl, crawl our way south. So if you're really high or low latitudes, we're going to, you're going to get, you'll be on just a little bit later in the call. Um, all right. Um, now um, let's, let's throw it open to um, sort of mid latitude folks, anybody sort of mid latitudes. Um, if you folks want, I can show you what I was up to kind of we're now, uh, I had a, um, a, a, a good time and have a few items to show you. I was using the, um, that sun chart to log mine. That, that's the download on my website. So I downloaded that. Um, and let's take a look at... Let's turn this over. Whoop. All right. Um, so I uh, got up early in the morning. Yeah, in the San Francisco Bay Area here, at least where I was, there was absolutely no fog. So a completely cloudless sky as it is today. Um, a few birds were singing, oak titmice, golden crown sparrows. I could hear those. There's a light frost on the ground. Um, and what I did is I used that sun chart to, to record my observations throughout the day. At the start, every uh, 15 minutes or so, and then I switched to every hour. And um, here is the chart of that. So it started off around 120 degrees and rose slowly in the sky to only about 30 degrees where I was at noon. And that was, was, was interesting. Um, and then down again to around, yeah, maybe uh, to 30 degrees. Um, so that was the path. And again, I'm getting all that data off of here where I had a toothpick sticking up here and I was just um, recording the length of the shadow and the direction of that shadow by drawing a line over it on a piece of paper that was oriented to magnetic north. I then took that same information and put it into my old, um, the, the document that I've been keeping of all of my journal entries. Um, this was the summer solstice, this big arc through the sky. Here is the equinox in orange. The purple line is my prediction of what I thought it would do. What I did is I basically took this amount and I just kind of lowered, lowered things by that same amount. And that's exactly what it did. So it went right where I thought it would. And that was kind of fun to see that I got to sort of predict what the, the sun's path would. I couldn't predict this. I didn't know what it would do. But once I had these two data points, I was able to predict that. The other thing that was neat was that um, here in the middle, it's at noon. And here in the middle, it was at one o'clock, um, the highest point. And that I was, first I was like, oh my gosh, that's weird. Then I was like, oh yeah, the daylight savings. We, we've now fallen back to our regular kind of clock time. And so now noon is in the middle of the day when noon wasn't back here. So that was kind of fun to see, just like the impact of daylight savings time. That made me kind of, that made me happy. But look at that. I mean, what, I mean, whoa, that's, 
That's crazy. I mean, this was, this was, yeah. And now, and then, and then that. And so I just had a really fun time out there. And now I got to draw penguins on my page and life is good. Um, had also a good time on the, uh, going out and watching the conjunction with my daughters. Um, so there are several planets, uh, and several planets and moons that were visible. Mars was up high overhead. Um, we could see Saturn and Jupiter. So that night there were four planets visible. That was pretty cool. Um, so we have, these are the moons. The top one was Callisto, then Io, and then Europa down there. Europa, a really interesting moon. Um, and then actually one of the moons of Saturn is visible. So Titan was off to the right of, of, of Saturn. So I put those in. Um, so I got those off of a star chart to figure out which moon was which one. When I look at them, you can't tell. They just look like dots in the sky. So I have to look that up. They're kind of fun to see which moons are, are, are out. And all of these, uh, the, the moons of Jupiter are named after um, mortal women who were um, uh, also kind of uh, hooked up with Zeus. Pretty cool. I had a lot of fun with that. Let's see what was up for um, other people. Who would like to share what you were doing? We're going to go to gallery view here. So hold um, your journal page up to the screen if you'd like to share it. Um, I'm going to jump over to Kathy Knight. So first, start by uh, telling us, Kathy, where you're based, what you had, what you were looking at, and um, what went on for you. Well, this is my backyard, and I'm north of San Diego on the California coast. And um, let me get rid of this little block here in the middle. And the top one is the June solstice, and the bottom one is the uh, winter solstice. And the highest point for the sun for me was 55 degrees, maybe closer to 60. And in the summer, it was way up at, I can't read, night about 95 degrees. And I noticed the um, time change as well. And I thought that was really fascinating. And I never would have done this except for your uh, workshop on, on tracking the sun and I just really enjoyed it and thank you so much it was and, really fun and isn't it fun to have them on the same page together it really is fun <laughs> so anyway thank you so much for teaching me how to do this I really really enjoyed it oh absolutely you now have your very own paper hinge that's right <laughs> that's right that's really cool um let's see what else is going on um is uh, anyone in the Southern Hemisphere? Uh, anybody dropping in from the Southern Hemisphere? Aw, I was hoping we'd have someone from the Southern Hemisphere. Well, um, let's let's see an, another. Uh, is there another journal page that we can take a look at? Is anybody else willing to share? what they did. Um, Kristen. Howdy, y'all. Um, I'm at San, in San Francisco, California, in the city. And I'm at 38 degrees latitude. And here is my paper hinge. And um, I do like how imperfect it is. And more of a, you know, I, I was glad to hear that the rotation around the earth is um, elliptical and not perfectly or around. So you can kind of see that in the sky. Um, my numbers for the height are just a little off and I should probably change them. But yeah, like John was saying, I think the highest that it reached here in San Francisco was like 35 degrees. And I was using, you know, my fist the potato method for to, to measure the height as well. And I did notice something that when I looked at the degrees of the winter solstice versus the summer solstice and I um, subtracted the difference, 
um, between the equinox, the, the, oh, I should talk better, between the summer solstice, the autumnal equinox and the winter solstice, I noticed that there was a difference of about 35, 40 degrees. And is that equivalent to my latitude? And I think that would make sense because if you are at a lower latitude, the difference between your sunrise um, coordinates would be closer together. And the, when you would subtract the difference, the numbers would be, the difference would be smaller, just like your latitude number would be lower from the equator. Um, and then I, of course, you're not supposed to be looking at the sun, um, but you know, I did do like, it's kind of kind of glary, but I did like a little photo collage. Too much glare, huh? Oh. I did, I did a little photo collage, but yeah, you're not supposed to be looking at the sun. <laughs> that is so cool. Yeah. Okay, so there is that. It was I had a lot of fun too during this pandemic, and I really looked forward to um, today. Um, I teach high school biology, and um, I did share my. They were looking forward to seeing my paper hinge, so I was <laughs> able to email everyone it um, last night. That Thank is you. really neat, and I like your idea of of, of the photographs uh, yeah. of, of time, um, and. Uh, that's that's really cool. Yeah, that was um, fun. So the so uh, so John, uh, cor cor correct me on this. If I were to take a, pic a photograph of the sun at the same time um, every day throughout a year, would would that inscribe the uh, analemma? Yes, it would. Yes, uh huh. It sure would. So, uh, absolutely. yeah. So, what we've just seen with Kristen's thing here is that um, Kristen has, but uh, also kind of had this cool idea of, of, of being able to look out that window and get it through that those photographs throughout the day. I like yeah. having the photograph one, the drawn one, all of those things together. Yes, this yes. Is really cool. I think my next kind of geek out direction is trying to figure out a way I can record and document now that we've done uh the this the solstices and the equinoxes i want to try to start figuring out how i can inscribe my own analemma um so that'll that'll be a kind of a a, a fun project so jack uh mm -hmm. my brother john talked about putting a reflective object on a windowsill in the south window and leaving it there all year, and the reflection of it would make an analemma up on the ceiling. If right? you record, if you if you were to mark your ceiling at the same time every day, right? Yes, yes, that's right. another way to do it without looking at the sun. Interesting. This is there's. I think this is there's some serious geek out potential here. Some serious geek out potential here. Um, Let's see, um, is there another journal page we could check out? Um, let's jump over to London. Uh, Ray Bonto, it is good to see you again. Yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah, we decided to, uh, uh, it was very really cloudy. Uh, the sun showed out a bit, but by the time I um, managed to, take my measuring tape out it was overcast again um so we had to do it from an app at home um, mm -hmm. and then we also i also decided to add a, a it's, a, it's this blue line of yellow dots over here and i also decided to add a summer solstice in comparison nice also i noticed that it was qu uh, quicker coming down or oh, i'm showing you uh, yeah coming down then it was rising. Um, oh, interesting. I, I put that in. Also, over here, I put the key, uh, uh, and there was, wasn't any space. So I decided to add my notes over here uh, underneath using tape. And then I also saw a squirrel. So I decided to add that in too. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, 
Um, oh, hey, I, I, I also I had fun making kind of a little flip book with with mine with my data, and it just made me think it would be more fun to start to add in more of these little flip book things to to journals. I love that you have that little show us that little flip book that you made. You've got the key. Yeah, and the notes and the squirrel. Ah. And then this was inspired by your solstice. Oh, on. Um, yep. so. He's saying this is inspired by your solstice note. Oh, yeah. fine. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Well, well, thank you. That's really cool. Um, yeah, the I think it's going to be fun to sort of play with. Um, It'll be interesting to see if being how being kind of playful with these kind of flip book views in a journal will kind of get our brains to sort of think in different ways. I think that, that uh, that's got some real potential. Thank you so much for sharing those, um, those, those notes from London. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, are there any other journal pages that we can check out? Um, let's jump over um, to go to, um, we're gonna do it in this order. Uh, we're gonna go Rebecca, then Brenda, then Mary. Um, uh, uh, Rebecca, hey there. Hi, so I'm from Syracuse, New York, and it was also overcast almost the whole day, so I wasn't able to do um, the what everybody else is doing, but I'm pretty excited about what I ended up coming up with instead, which is that I drew this circle showing starting at midnight and going through the whole day and showing the hours of the like the percent of the day that was daylight compared to nighttime and then I showed coming out of here um, different things I observed in nature just kind of like what's the story of what was going on with everything else today so I got some animals and some animal tracks and other observations and then I showed the weather kind of in the inside of the circle. Um, so like it was overcast, the sun came out for like about an hour or so here. So I was thinking maybe we'll get to see the conjunction after all, oh. but it uh, was not to be. Oh. <laughs> um, but I, I drew this here anyway, um, even though I couldn't see it for real life. And then um, I got a little bit more like imaginative up at the top of just, um, doing like winter is the time of rest and these kind of starry dreamlike animals and fantasy creatures. Oh, and just, that is fun. And, and what a cool way to visualize the circle of the time of the day and then to put events in on that. It makes me think about like, I've done these kind of event maps where I draw a place and the things that I'm encountering in different places. But this is doing that and bringing in the factor of time. Those, the weather on the inside and biological events on the outside. This is a really creative visualization. And I was thinking about how you could use this format to gather any sort of data you want if you wanted to track it through the day. Like you could, like I did weather here, but you could also do temperature or anything else. Or if you were watching the behavior of an animal throughout the day, or even if you want to track your own behavior. So I think there's a lot of possibility for it. There is. This is cool. This is cool. Um, so something that we like looking at in the Nature Journal Club here is not just, um, not just our observations, but ways of thinking about and recording observations. Because when you have, when you do it this way, it will force you to start thinking about time in a different way. And that's good, that's really good. Doing it in, if you did this over a map, it would force you to think about space. So the way you do it, the way you document things on your page changes the way you think and interact with the environment. And so let's remember this, everybody, this idea of, the time circle. What what do you want to call this technique, uh, Rebecca? Uh, 
I don't know. I need to think about that. Okay, we got to come up with a good name for it that, that is descriptive, and so we can kind of tag that um, because this is this is a really good visualization tool that you're absolutely right. You could repurpose this for thinking about all sorts of other interesting things. Um, I was thinking with everyone showing the winter solstice compared to the summer solstice. And so I was thinking about how, how different this would look like it's one extreme for where I live only a little bit of daytime and mostly nighttime. And then the other time of year is only a little of nighttime. So I think that would be interesting to look at um, throughout the year too. Yeah. And, and also wouldn't it be fun to um, you, you know, if you were on a kind of a, take a hypothetical road trip um, from from Churchill, Alaska, down through um, uh, down to the, uh, the 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 tip of Argentina, um, and how this diagram on one day would change as you slid down the globe, or one place over time so you could keep time a constant and visualize how this would change over the year or keep um uh, uh so, so, so you keep time as the variable and you're looking at how that changes over the year or you could keep lo location could be the variable and how that would change as you traveled from north to south um on the globe in a single day i mean that could be I'm just saying this is cool way of thinking. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, let's um, let's take a look at um, I think Michael Helm. I thought I saw you. Hello. Ah, oh, hello. Ah, there we go. We can't see this very well. I had to. I had to grab a new chart because my stuff from the Equinox went AWOL some other place. But this was a real learning experience for me because I could not keep a constant location. The, the, the solar, solar noon I spaced out on a mist. I, I happen to know that at this longitude, it's about 1207. We're just a little bit off in this time zone. But I missed it. But it, it looks like it was about 30 degrees, which was, was about our maximum. But I could not keep the same place. In fact, I think every measurement is at a different place. The reason is the path is so low that it crosses every tree, yep. house, yep. pole imaginable. So 15 minutes later, that, that little piece of sidewalk is blocked. And, but that was actually valuable to learn because what I learned is every bit of sidewalk is angled a little bit differently. And this thing uh, yes. is walking back and forth. So if you're in the same place, you at least have the same systematic error. But every place I was at, every one had a different error. Yeah. I'm sure of it now. So that, now, that... I've, now I've learned that if I, if I do this again, I've got to find one stable platform and it's, I've got to level it. So you're, you're, you're absolutely right. So the, so there's, there's a couple of things. One is that you can move it all around your neighborhood. As long as you're reorienting it, you're cool. But if the paper is not on a level surface, then it's going to make a much longer or shorter um, shadow. It uh, makes a big difference at this time of year. A huge yeah. difference because the shadows are so long. Interesting. But the earlier ones, we did. I didn't even notice it because I did have to move a little for the uh, the equinox, and for the, the the summer solstice, I wouldn't have had to move. Although I didn't do it consistently that day. Yeah. But in the backyard, in the backyard mm -hmm. where I where I have a different view, and this is a, a kind of crude drawing. Like I said, my my previous work went AWOL. It's so low that it comes very close to the treetops, even in the backyard. Mm. I think it would be very interesting to set up a camera there and track it during the day. That's cool. I've also I've also been following the conjunction for months. I don't I'd have love too to many see your drawings. documentation of that. I don't have too many drawings of it, but one thing that I, let's see here's, here's one from one from last night. I think you can see that. The one thing that puzzles me is that my, my 
my view of the, the Jovian moons, let's see, and I got the right document here. It's, it's everything's, yeah, that's right. Everything's backwards to me in this Zoom image. Uh, my my picture of where the Jovi, the Gal, Galilean moons are never matches up with what I see in those star charts. I, I'm always looking at that and going, what? So I, I, I think because I look at this all the time, I do a bird observation thing at sunset. So we're always looking at Jupiter in the fall and in the spring. It, it, well, Jupiter's usually not up in the spring right now, but. Um, I think I'm going to look at these charts and, and see if I can try to calibrate that better because it's just where it thinks Callisto is and where I think it is just don't make any sense to me and uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, there, there are limits to what I can see with the scope anyway. Um, but, yeah, and, and also I noticed you've got that one that was further down on the far right hand side that thing that was in line with all the moons. I'm going to yeah. who is that down there I couldn't figure, I couldn't get that. I don't know that that looks like because it's so perfectly in line that yep. looks like Callisto to me and Callisto is the furthest I know that one's the furthest one out. But it's does it match the chart The the online charts don't don't show that configuration. In fact, they show I think they show Ganymede doing a crossing. Uh, I think they show Ganymede crossing Jupiter at that time because I was looking at this earlier today and um, I wouldn't be able to see that. With the, the scope that I have, I wouldn't be able to resolve it, uh, but that's possible. But I, I, I've noticed before. I, I, when when I take, when I do a drawing or when I take a picture of where those moons are, and then I go and look at the charts, it's like, nope. It it's I, I have to like roll a couple of hours backwards and forwards. So something, something's not right there. I don't know. Right. I'd like to, I'd like that I'd like to get to the bottom of that because I'm probably the one that's wrong because perhaps you know, I'm so just the, seeing what I'm yeah, seeing. You but, hold both of those as possible hypotheses, right? Yeah, um, those are both possible explanations. The um, uh, there's a uh, the wonderful bird watcher Rich Stallcup used to say that when the bird in the book disagree, believe the bird, <laughs> right? And so if you say like, you know, here are my direct observations, but it says on this website that it should be over there, right? Yeah. Huh, uh, well, that's interesting. I, I figure the, the, the web guys got their orbital mechanics right, but uh, I don't know, just never matches. I don't know, what, what do you use? What did you use to ID your, what star uh, charting thing did you use? Um, I used, a, it was a, 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 I got that off of a website um, and that was, uh, I forget which one. Yeah, I've looked at a couple, and and there there's one that seems to have pretty good pictures, but I just it just never matches. Never. Yeah. Uh, that's so, cool. Oh, thank you. That's what I've got. Thank you. Um, and then also Mary. Um, I think you had. Okay. Um, okay. Now, uh, I live in the uh, right outside. We have where we live, clear view to the um, off the west side of Manhattan. Okay. So we can see New Jersey, we can see west and the buildings in New Jersey are fairly low. I was excited all day long. It was clear, great day. Oh. Went out 4.30, all cloudy. <laughs> so here's what I saw. Here's New Jersey. Here's the sky. <laughs> OK, so and then here's what I saw on the um, live stream. I believe I've, I labeled this New Jersey. It's not New Jersey. It's, it's Arizona. <laughs> mm -hmm. So here's what I wish I had seen. Yep. And this is superimpose this up. under yeah. <laughs> what I wish I said. Here's what I saw. <laughs> oh, that's that's fun. Okay, it was. I was excited, but maybe tonight. But it looks cloudy again. This is winter oh. in my neck of the woods. Well, Mary, uh, <laughs> if it, we didn't have this COVID, I would invite you over um, <laughs> here to I'd California. I'd come in a minute if we didn't. Yeah. Um, yeah, because what what's also sort of uh, fun um, is that the 
uh, I also those uh, those colors, those sunset colors. Um, I I really really like. Um, we get great sunsets, but you know, and then the, <laughs> no stars. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, something that was um, interesting. Let me show you this little sketch here. Smaller. Um, everyone, I'm going to go to this view. So, what I, I the uh, the big view here is the through my telescope. Mm. Um, this little inset over here. Yeah. That's what's cool. That's what. Um, that's what I'm seeing when I look up in the sky with those objects that close to each other. So um, that is the little inset is is your uh, just without any yes uh, without magnification. Telescope. That's right. Do binoculars do anything? They said you could use binoculars, but I don't have a telescope. Yeah, uh, binoculars or through binoculars. Um, you should be able to really resolve these. You probably won't be able to see moons um, mm -hmm. and the rings, but yeah. you will be able to. Um, uh, you you will be able to see them as um, not just a point of light, but as a two dimensional circle. Oh, you could, okay. Cool. Uh, you, that's a great way of 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 spotting uh, planets. Is that you put your um, you put your your telescope or your binoculars on them, and mm -hmm. through the telescope, what you see then is a circle, and through a um, through a uh, through binoculars, a star will always just look like a little pinpoint of light. Oh, okay. Um, but also directly overhead. Uh, these nights, we've got Mars is up there, so lo also look for a little dot that is a little mm -hmm. round circle. Yeah, okay. Um, and um, that's fun. Yeah, if the, cl if, it, if the clouds ever clear up. Yes, I'm, I'm sending you uh, all sorts of good cloud clearing thoughts okay. for tonight. We'll, we'll send you some rain. <laughs> we'll I, I, some I, rain. I, we could you definitely use that. Okay, we'll uh, do we a trade. <laughs> okay, thank that's you. A good trade. That's a good trade. Uh, thank you, Mary. Thank you so much. No um, so let's, um, Brian, have you been able to spot any cool uh, questions uh, we have for John over there in the uh, discussion? Yeah, there were a couple. Uh, people were curious about how you do the analemma using a reflective device. And then also, uh, what was the azimuth at Antarctica during solar noon? Let's see. Um, again, I think the azimuth at solar noon is about 23 degrees, which is the tilt of the Earth's axis. Does that make sense? Oh, wow. I think that's right. That's, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. Because if there, was, if there was no tilt, I think we would be at zero degrees. And since there is tilt, the maximum tilt would, would reach 23 and a half degrees. And and as for the analemma, I don't know if the, you know, people say you could put a quarter on the south facing windowsill, but I don't think that's a bright enough and sharp enough reflection. Mm. It would be kind of a concave little mirror device so that it would make us a, a really sharp spot on the ceiling. Uh, there's a lot of ways to do it. You can Google many, many ways to track an analemma without using a camera. There's ways to do it on the ground. Uh, I think, um, I, I didn't look this up ahead of time, but I, I'm just imagining in my head that I think you could set up a stand where maybe, <clears throat> what, four or six feet off the ground, you have a, a plate or a table with a, a hole in it. And it would have to be very thin metal at this area because thick metal, the sun couldn't get through a thick hole at an angle, but a very thin uh, piece of metal with a hole in it would project the sun spot down onto the ground. And I suppose that one could mark the ground every day at noon um, uh, with this pinhole method, but I've, I've, I haven't tested that. 
but there's a lot of you can Google it. There's a lot of ways to do it, and the I think the ceiling's kind of a, a silly one because you know who wants to mess up their ceiling with a figure eight? Well, we all do probably. Yeah, I, I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but the problem is kind of getting up to the ceiling. Uh, yeah. Well, by the way, John, John, could I say, uh, Jack, could I say something real quick? Please. Uh, point out that the the current, uh, you know, we're 93 million miles from the sun. So what, almost 100 million or a tenth of a billion miles from the sun. And just Jupiter and Saturn alone are half a billion miles apart right now. And I think that, I think that Jupiter, the closest one to us, I think Jupiter is over a billion miles from us. Yeah, that's cool. Looking at a billion and a billion and a half miles, more than, you know, just the billion is more than 10 times the distance from us to the sun. And it, to me, it's amazing that we can see either one of these things with the naked eye. It's, it's just incredible. That's, that, that, that really does put it in perspective. Yeah. And, and just so everybody knows, um, because of this geeking out, uh, there will be a future Nature Journal workshop um, on analemmas and um, how we can uh, create those and, and construct those. I now am uh, determined to create a backyard analemma generator um, for, for my backyard. Um, and um, I'll be, uh, once I kind of get some uh, uh, experiments with that going, um, I'm gonna share that and we'll, um, you know, why is this big figure eight? Why do you see a picture of that on all the globes? You know, what's up with it? Why is it so important? And um, what is its kind of relation to navigation and to thinking about our place in the universe. It'll be a lot of fun. Um, so everybody, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Um, uh, also, I want to, to, to send my, uh, my thanks to, to John um, and uh, also Anne for um, for being part of this um, this this workshop, sharing with us what um, what's been going on in Antarctica and your observations uh, from there. I I thought we we're going to have a few folks on from the southern hemisphere today. Unfortunately, we didn't. Um, the um, one other kind of cool thing is that uh, when you look at the and you'll have to sort of turn your head upside down and figure out your challenge is to figure out why this is. Um, if you, if somebody from the Southern Hemisphere were to hold up their star chart, uh, or not their star chart, their, um, their, their solstice chart, and say, they would be saying, all right, my, I, I watched my sun come up here and then come down over here. What would be really interesting about it is that it would go in the opposite direction than what you're seeing up here in the Northern Hemisphere. So on mine, I see the sun coming up on the left and going down on the right, right? So it moves from left to right across my page. In the Southern Hemisphere, you have to figure out why. Why is it going the other way? And similarly, when you look at the moon, the moon, when you look at a crescent, um, a waxing crescent moon on the, in the Northern Hemisphere, you look at a, a backward C. But that same moon in the southern hemisphere is a proper facing sea. Why is that? So that's your challenge to kind of turn your head around and you have to kind of get out one of these things and kind of think like, if I was like here looking at that, but then why? Well, I don't know. Like what? Ah, that's, that's what, it'll be kind of fun to, to, to think about all of those things. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you for celebrating this um, event with us and uh, geeking out. Um, again, gratitude to uh, Anne and the researchers at Point Blue for the work that they're doing. Gratitude to you, John, for sharing your experience um, there on the ice. Thank um, you. John, may I also recommend to the group the song by Jethro Tull, Ring Out Solstice Bells. Ring out solstice bells. Joyful as the silver planets run. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody, you take care. Thank you for being here. And um, so uh, just a few community announcements before we go. Um, 
tomorrow uh, there will be an educators forum um, for people who are nature journaling educators who want to um, share thoughts and ideas. Um, and Thursday, um, Christmas Eve, there will be a class on how to draw reindeer. This is to prepare people for making illustrations of any um, rooftop fauna that may show up. Um, so to prepare you for that <coughs> possibility. Um, and uh, um, let's see, uh, Brian, do you have, uh, or let's see, um, Avea or Brian, do um, either of you have any community announcements? Yavea may have an announcement about her pencil miles. I believe she has it Saturday. Uh, just as a follow-up to um, an earlier question, Jack, we were curious what your guess for the penguins was. Oh, my guess, um, I would go back in there. I think it, I was guessing, uh, was it 240? Okay. I was thinking 240 or 230. No, through. Yeah, uh, 240. Mine, I think mine was 240. All right. We um, took a look at the aggregate and it looks like it's around 150 for the group guess. So we'll see what the. Interesting. So the range um, and, is down from 74 to 240 or so. Cool. Um, and if you send me that image, I will sit there and I'll count all the penguins. All right. Um, I can do that. And I also uh, reposted just now the link to the PDF of our quarterly where I took that picture from. So you can go download it yourself and oh. uh, have a look. And I'll send it to you, Jack, for sure. And I right. can share it again if you want right now on the screen. But Jack, you said 124. That's what you posted. 124. OK. Did you have 124? That's that sounds See, uh, with my dyslexic <laughs> ability to kind of uh, scramble everything up, it's hard for me to. I, I actually have a card inside my wallet that tells my address and my telephone number, not just for if the wallet gets lost. I People say, like, what's your telephone number? And I say, oh, hold on, let me look that up. <laughs> I look at my telephone number. Um, the uh, I actually don't know from day to day how old I am. Um, and so numbers, for some reason, have a hard time sticking in my brain. Um, but uh, so I said 124. It'll be interesting to see what we what what it is. Um, but yeah, try that. Put your address and your telephone number if you ever forget where you live. Um, Avid, did you want to have any community announcements? Um, just to verify that, uh, yes, uh, Pencil Miles and Chill will be on Saturday, the 26th, first day of Kwanzaa, um, but not Friday because I figure that people might be busy on Christmas doing things. Wow. Um, but I will definitely be having it um, Friday, New Year's um, Day, the first, and Saturday, the second, because, hey, why not begin the year with Pencil Miles, right? <laughs> Absolutely right. Um, and I'm the same way, Jack. I also forget my age. The last age I remember being is the age my son was born, and now I don't remember. So you're not alone in that. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I, once uh, actually a, um, uh, who was there? There's a, um, uh, there was some, wasn't a police officer, but there was some kind of official person who, why were they asking me? I was supposed to give like all sorts of, you know, personal identifying information to this person. And I'm like, I don't remember. Can I look in my wallet? <laughs> and they were thinking like, you are, there's some bad things going on with this guy. What was that context? I, I don't remember. Anyway, um, but uh, there you go. Hey, everybody. Um, thank you all for being here. Vea, Brian, John. And thank you for being part of this team. All the people who participated, we're so grateful for you. And all the people who joined us here um, as part of this community, we're really, really happy to be here. We hope that this coming year for you is going to be a really good one and a really safe one. Um, along with that, here's your public safety announcement. Um, the, uh, here in the San Francisco Bay Area, our COVID numbers are wildly climbing. Um, and um, part of that is, is, is due to well, just, you know, we get tired of being away from each other and we really, really miss each other. 
And it's hard to be apart, especially on the holidays when many of us, you know, suffer from depression and, you know, getting together with people who you love and you know and you have history with is just part of our traditions. It's something that we've always done. Right now, that behavior is dangerous. That behavior is, is dangerous to you and it's dangerous to the ones who you love the most. And I just want to encourage people to, to, to be strong, to show your love and kindness in ways that are going to keep those people who are the most important and most special to you safe. It's, it's so hard, it is so hard to do. Um, but the, the impact of this, this epidemic is it, is, it is tragic, it is devastating. And, um, and I just want to encourage all of you to be as safe as you can. Um, and my brother and I, whenever we go backpacking together, um, he's got my back, I've got his back. And when we go backpacking together, if we're trying to like, should we go down that, we'll do a lot of off trail cross country stuff. Um, the, uh, we're not seeing each other during this COVID stuff, but when we are and we're out there together and we're trying to figure out, should we go down that draw? Um, if one of us says, you know what? I don't feel safe doing that. Whoever makes the most conservative call on safety is the brother who will kind of dictate our, our path for that, that day. So whatever is the most conservative thing, um, we will go with that. And, um, and we both know that. And the result is we're able to go into all sorts of crazy, craggy places. But because we have that basic rule, we always come out safely. And this is another one of those times. There's a real danger around. And there's lots of pressures to, to put caution aside. And um, so if there's a voice inside you that is considering, you know, like maybe we should do this, um, that more conservative voice at this time, I want to encourage you to respect it, to listen to it. And, and it's hard, um, but, um, but, but listen to that, 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 that more, cautious voice inside of you at this time. The vaccines are coming and this will change. We, we have gone through this for a year and we will emerge on the other side of it. We are, the end is close, right? So please take care of yourself, take care of others. And Avea, you wanted to add something to that? First of all, Thank you for what you just said. Um, I find what you just said to be very moving. And in light of what you just said, I'm changing my mind. We're gonna have pencil mouths on Friday in case anybody's lonely on Christmas. So thank you. And everybody stay safe. Thank you, Ave. Dear friends, Take care of each other. You are a beautiful community and you are strong and uh, you are not alone. <laughs>